assalamu alaikum everyone and uh, as always nice to have you back uh, today we'll do uh, Augustan poetry uh, and we have a surprise because there are two women poets today to talk about and at the same time we have two uh, obvious uh, classmates here doing presentations which is uh, always an amazing thing so let's see the presentations and then go back to the Augustan age you can start now and Hello everyone, my name is Hilda Gmosh. Uh, today, inshallah, I will talking about uh, metaphysical poetry. Um, we can describe metaphysical poetry as a fruit of, uh, of the Renaissance tree. Uh, what is the metaphysical poetry? Uh, metaphysical poetry is a group of poetry emerged in the beginning of the 17th century, whose poetry comes to be known uh, as the metaphysical poetry. Metaphysical literally, um, meta means uh, beyond, and physics means um, physical nature. Metaphysical uh, concerned with the fundamental problems of the nature or, or a place in life. Uh, John Donne was the founder of the uh, metaphysical poetry. He tried to write poetry in a different way, but the, uh, but, uh, the name of metaphysical poetry is given by Dr. Samuel Johnson uh, for the first time when he wrote the, uh, the life of Abraham Cowley in his book, The Lives of Poets. But he used it in a negative sense to criticize uh, the poetry for of the uh, Unusual images. Um, unusual images in we makes the poetry is difficult. Uh, images uh, taken from field of knowledge, science, uh, architecture, geography, history, uh, astronomy, uh, chemistry, architecture, geometry, uh, mathematics, and biology, med medical, etc. For example, today uh, the flea by John Dunn. The flea marked by this flea and marking this how, how little that which that, uh, that denied me is. It sucked me first and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two blood mangled be. Thou knowest that this can uh, this cannot be said, a sin nor, sh nor shame nor nor loss of maiden maiden hate. Uh, this is taken from field of um, of biology. I'm of biology. And this poetry is taken. This poetry is taken from field of uh, biology, and, uh, and the flea is a uh, the flea is a small insect. The small insect uh, with sucks blood from a human body. This insect used here as a as the theme of the ex expression of love. To as uh, conclusion, uh, of the flea. Uh, the flea uses a conceit as a means of uh, flirtation and, se and sexual cor corrections too. The flea metaphor re represents den uh, denied sensual pleasure. Its tiny scale reflects the, the insignificance of the woman's chastity. Its body containing the blood of a speaker and mistress uh, symbolizes the onion between uh, the couple. Here is the part of, uh, the, part of, of the reason. Uh, they perhaps to see how one how one image um, can be is, is stretched to a comedian a range of meanings and association. They show uh, they show the thrilling possibilities of language, but to poetic use. I uh, thank you. This is my presentation. It's interesting that some of you find the poetry of interesting and thrilling. Maybe I disagree with the description that physical poetry is difficult, or that metaphysical poetry, or even speaking, analyzing the word metaphysical itself, because in our discussion we came to the conclusion that metaphysical doesn't things. necessarily mean nothing. It was used just to it's say that those people are bad. Yes. The poetry is not about metaphysicality generally. It's yep. it's different. They were writing against the against the the the, the current. So uh, I was also hoping for. Uh, some commentary on the woman here in the text. Generally, we said so far the society has been anti feminist, where women are presented as weak, less weak, less intelligent, less intelligent, unintellectual compared to, to men. Men have more freedom. Is John Donne treating 
the woman in the poem the same? That is an interesting question. Someone else can probably do a presentation uh, on this. But maybe I can tell you that the 20th century uh, greatest feminist, uh, 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 Virginia Woolf, she praised John Donne. She is the same critic who praised Afra Ben. So if a feminist praises John Donne, probably he's doing something to empower women, to give them uh, a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Hen. Yeah, please. Maybe he's trying to be different and be with women, not, not to be against women like other poets. And this is something new. This, this is something <coughs> experimental. People were not used to women having a voice. Uh, in, because in this poem, when the poet is, is telling uh, his beloved that you and me and the flea are one yes. in this crazy... It's in a way similar to the guy who told... Actually, we'll study this. Someone who wants to deceive the woman to trick her, to take her money. Here, in a way, he wants to take something else. But the poet is saying, uh, we are the same. Yeah. And the woman is not tricked. <coughs> he doesn't deceive her. Because what does she do? She kills the flea. She acts. She acts. She, acts. she takes action, exactly. So he t he's telling her, because listen, when we speak about three, we speak about trinity, you know, in Christianity. God, God. So he's telling her, this is a sacred creature now, because it has the blood of three. It's like Jesus Christ, God, and everything. She's like, she kills the flea, this simply, an act of action. The woman might not speak here, but she takes action. She does the most significant thing in the poem. And this is generally what a woman does uh, in John Donne. Next, we have Hanin uh, with another presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Hanin. Today, I will talk about satire. So firstly, what is satire? Satire is a technique employed by writers to uh, criticize corruption, to sa satirize corruption of an individual or a society. Uh, satir satirical writing is usually funny. So the main purpose of uh, uh, the main purpose of satire is not to humor, but to, to criticize corruption. There are four techniques to, uh, to uh, produce satire. The first one is reversal. When normal rules or, or order are reversed. The second one is parody. Parody is a humorous, humorous and exaggeration, exaggerated imita imitation. The third one is incongru incongruity. Is some uh, something that seems out of place or out of character. The uh, the last one is exaggeration. It's giving an impression that something something is greater or larger than it really is. Uh, so using humor is more effective than if you wa uh, want to say this is uh, wrong. But if you use humor, is uh, this is something will be more effective than if you say uh, if you say uh, this is wrong. So this is an extract by John Wilmot. Who can read it? Who can read it? I'd be a dog, a monkey, a bear, or anything but that vain animal who is so proud of being rational. Yes, uh, this is uh, uh, an. Uh, this is uh, uh, satire in general. Satire in general by John Wilmot. And the second one is, who can read it? Yes. Blots, true or, fa or false, are necessary things to raise up commonwealths and doing kings. This is uh, extract by Dryden. Uh, and this one is more specific than the first one. The last one is by who can read? Yeah. There is some fans meaning make written written. I shall well never divide and present. This is uh, this extract uh, uh, to satire someone who called uh, Shadwell. Shadwell, uh, Dryden describes Shadwell as the master, as the master of the dullness, as the master of dullness, and this is uh, extract. Uh, this is satire, uh, personal satire. This is personal satire. 
And this was our lesson about it. Thank you. Thank you, When when you do presentations, can you try to bring uh, texts from outside the, the, the course so we can learn extra things? This is the uh, one significant thing about uh, the presentation. So we want to see what you do with extra texts, with, with texts from outside the, the course. Okay? So I, it would be a lot better. But this is really interesting. I like that you like uh, Satya and you also mentioned uh, parody and, and stuff we talk about in, in a bit. So let's go back to our class. The Augustan Age is actually generally named the Augustan Age because the rules of poetry followed by major critics like uh, Samuel Johnson and Alexander Pope. But before I speak about Augustan poetry, Alexander Pope, Mary Montagu, and Mary Liber, I want to say something about parody. We spoke about parody last time, remember? And most, even when Hanin mentioned parodies, she said some humorous, exaggerated imitation. When you open most dictionaries, they will always mention the word comic, or humorous, or funny, a funny imitation of something, a funny uh, representation of something that already existed, whether it is a person or a book. However, I believe, I believe that this is not accurate. This is not. 100% what parody does. Again, look at me. Why are you turning the pages? Is there something? OK, so today, again, I, before I, I, I go to Augustan poetry, I want to say something about parody. And I have to say it again. Pay attention, please. Uh, generally, any, most books tell you that parody is funny, comic, uh, uh, a humorous imitation of of something. Yes, parody imitates it because the word parody means to copy or to imitate. Now, is it always funny? Is it always humorous? Is it always less serious? This is what my, my point now. I think no, it's not because sometimes it could hurt people's feelings. So because if you're making fun of Is it is it only about hurting feelings? No. But there is one thing, it's about criticism. It's, it's about in my opinion parody is about change. Why would I parody somebody? Because yes, I want to make fun of them. But sometimes I don't want to make fun of them. It's not funny. Sometimes it's, tra it's tragic. So I want to criticize them to show their weaknesses, to show their vices, to, to show their, their corruption by imitating them in a way that like makes done. people pay, pay attention. My point is, generally, if this is the English channel, listen to this. If this is the, like, the English canon, you know the English canon, yeah, the yes. bulk of the most important, Written most anthologized works. literary works, where the mainstream critics and writers uh, like, like reside most of the time. So if this is the, the, the canon, uh, this is the bulk, this is the core. Some people live here in the margin, you know, the margin yeah. and Hamish. Yeah. Some people are marginalized. They are known, they're famous. But they're usually not mentioned and studied and researched. So they're pushed by critics to the margins of the society, of the canon. But some poets, we say, were kicked even outside. They're not in the margin or on the margin. They are here, outside. We mentioned Dunn, for example. Yes. Johnson criticized him. Dryden, Dryden. Uh, 50 years later, Dryden criticized him. Almost 100 years later, Johnson. Johnson criticized him. And then, well, even after his death, many people were threatened by people who would write differently. Uh, Afrabin was also considered to be uh, of less importance. Uh, and Mary Manley also was considered scandalous and objectionable and controversial in, in many ways. So people here, outside the canon, sometimes want to, to challenge, right? To engage in dialogue to engage in dialogue. Sometimes they want to define. Sometimes they want to criticize. Some, sometimes they want to subvert. You know what subvert is? 
when you subvert somebody's authority, you like you shake somebody's authority. So the king, remember the king is the king, the most important God's representative yes, on earth. If you parody the king, mm -hmm. it's as if you're telling people that the king is an ordinary person. He can be criticized. Shake his place. He can be to shake the idea. So because people think that uh, the king, the president is a person fearful. Untouchable. You can't touch him, you can't criticize him. When you parody him, it's like you're telling people that he's an ordinary person, he's a human being. I can talk about him in a particular way. In order to do this, those people outside the canon, they it usually can resort to parody. Parody, metafiction, intertextuality sometimes. And we've seen this in John Donne. Yes. Come live with me and be my love. love. We and we will sum new pleasures through. So if ordinary people would be, you know, the idealism of the Elizabethan age, yeah. all the pleasures, and we have a new poet who says, some, some new, new pleasures, okay, why some? Ah, because all is wrong, not realistic, and new, I want to see what, so he's shaking the world of the Elizabethan court, the love. This is what John Donne is doing. So when those people use parody, that who usually does the criticism? The one. Male critics, people in the, in the canon, people who create the canon. So are they going to be happy with the parody? No. They're not. Are they going to be happy with the parody? They are not. So for them, for Samuel Johnson, parody is not serious. It's called, I think, I'm not sure what exactly he says, but he says that parody is uh, less uh, serious, less important art than the original text. And it's interesting how Johnson, also hates puns. Remember we spoke about puns? Yeah. Yeah. Sun and sun. A, word a word with two meanings or yeah. sounds. Sun with, when you, a pun is a play on word, when you play with words. Yes. So those people even don't want us to play with words because they want us to follow the definitions in the dictionaries. But always there have always been poets who wanted to do things differently. Uh, Samuel Johnson, by the way, didn't like Tristram Shandy. And he also didn't like John Donne. And he also didn't like so why? Because they believed in the rules of the Quran, in following particular rules in order to write what they call a uh, great poetry. So you mean that the people who are kicked out of the uh, canon use parody as a weapon, to, okay, yeah, as a tool to criticize these people? Is it so how are these people going to define parody favorably or unfavorably? Unfavorably. unfavorably. So even the dictionary said, uh, yeah, there is fun, there is humor in parody. Not always. When you read, come live with me and be my love, and we will some new pleasures, we don't laugh. It's not funny, we don't kick it, there's no joke there. But John Donne attracts our attention, grabs our attention to the fact that there is another world different from the world, the idealistic world of, of uh, Christopher Marlowe. Um, uh, another more realistic uh, world, so to speak. Okay, so going back here today to uh, Augustan poetry, we have again three poets, Both. Alexander Paul, Mary Montague, and Mary Liver. One man, two women. And these are the first women poets to study. And this is the 18th century. And that is very interesting, because in Arabic traditions and culture, we have poets as far as, I think, 2,000, 1,500 years ago. Khansa was a famous uh, uh, poet, uh, Arab poet female are a poet. Is there something wrong with women? Are women unable to write poetry or to write? No. Definitely not. Definitely not. There's something wrong with the way the society deals with women, frames women, and marginalizes uh, women. So Alexander Paul is one of the neoclassicist uh, critics and, and poets. Before I speak a little bit about him, uh, here is one of his famous uh, heroic couplets, couplets from, I think, uh, an essay on criticism. He's speaking about poetry, about criticism, about poetry writing. And he says, those rules, the rules of writing, classification, of all discovered, not devised. So he's defending the rules of decorum. You know, Horus and Gustas are nature. So those are discovered from nature. 
They are nature still, but nature methodized, like systematized, organized. This is something like the likes of John Donne would disagree with, because he's saying the rules, and this is strange, the rules of poetry were not invented by anybody. We found them out there in nature exactly like we find a planet or, you know, some stars or some galaxies out there or some new species or birds or some type of, of fish. And this is, again, very interesting because for them, they actually have a point here. It doesn't mean their poetry sucks or they're bad or no, no. According to those people, the greatest poetry was written centuries ago, when man was not corrupted, when man was, didn't go even to university, was not taught to write poetry. Some people now go to study Arabic or English to be able to write poetry, right? Yeah. But those people didn't learn poetry from anybody. In a way, they were inspired. For those critics, the, this inspiration could be from nature or from God. So God teaches you how to write poetry. And nature teaches you how to, to write poetry. When you look at nature, you find everything symmetrical, everything organized. Look at the palm tree, for example. Look at the trees or things, at the birds. Look at them, how they are shaped and will, in a way, symmetrical. You know what's symmetrical? Everything is balanced, everything is organized. So the rules of writing, like a uh, particular line, some feet, some syllables, like 10 syllables, 10 syllables, 10 syllables, they're generally taken from where? inspired from nature. So they are not devised by anybody. They were discovered from, from nature. If you count the syllables here, you'll find it. I think I can bring you a thousand lines by Alexander Pobanol will be five feet, five feet, five feet, five feet. Strict about following uh, the rules. And this is a couplet. Why is this a couplet? When we speak about uh, Alexander Pope, we usually <coughs> speak about the heroic couplet. And a heroic couplet is basically a couplet. Like a, when, when you define a paragraph, you're studying writing now. Yes. A paragraph is a group of related sentences about an idea. So a, a couplet is two rhyming lines, ten syllables, one idea. Ten syllables or five feet. One idea. So, Alexander Pope was one of the major poets who followed the rules of the Quran. They were adopted during the uh, Augustan age from the Roman poet and critic whose name is Horace. Horace. Also, Horace did not invent the rules. He studied poetry and came up with the rules of poetry. Poetry. Writing. Were the rules different from the other rules? The what, what rules. You know, we took the, the, other, the old rules of the Quran were the similar. The, uh, uh, Dryden, Samuel Johnson, Alexander Pomodos both were inspired by Horus, who was inspired by Homer and those, and those poets. So they, so they were, were imitating. Many of those people believe good poetry is good imitation, to imitate nature, because nature has everything there for us. Something that John Donne, for example, didn't like and he wanted to change. In, he wrote several poems, we'll see two or three of, of them. One interesting poem by Alexander Pope is called An Essay on Man. You know what he's saying? Yes. You write an essay. Yeah, an article. An essay is generally in prose. But he was fascinated with poetry, obsessed with poetry. That this is not prose, this is poetry. This is verse. And be careful, this could be a new exam. So if I tell you, uh, a little learning is a dangerous thing, drink deep or taste not. The Pyrenean Spring is a couplet, a heroic couplet by Alexander Pope from his article and essay on criticism. Everything is fine with the sentence except the fact that this is not an article, it's a poem. So don't be tricked by, by the name. So what does he say here? He teaches Poets, he preaches uh, his ideology and what poetry should be about. Remember, for the rules of the Quran, literature has to teach and delight. When you read a poem, you have to learn something new, a wisdom, a moral lesson. So, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Have you ever heard of this before? Yeah. 
It's an English proverb, by the way. It's a wisdom. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. If you know a little thing, if you read only, you know, we have this type of people all the time. People who read two books and they think they are knowledgeable and well read. Or people who read, like, the introductions to a hundred pages and they will be. So he's criticizing those people. He's saying, a little learning is a dangerous thing. You either learn a lot or better not to learn. Because if you don't learn, generally you might admit that you are uneducated, illiterate. But if you read two books and you think you are a poet or a writer or a political analyst, your analysis and everything might not be uh, good or something. So what is his, his advice? Drink deep or taste not the Pyrrhean spring. You know what does, what does spring mean here? Pyrrhean is, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it, but what does spring mean here? No, don't read what is written in the book. It's not correct. Maybe the full knowledge? Spring, the word spring. Like spring, like summer and spring. Mm. Taste not, drink deep or taste not the spring. Spring is a place where water flows. No. Spring. There's something called hot springs where hot water springs from the uh, spring. So either you, the Perian spring is a metaphor for the spring of knowledge. Remember, yeah. education, everything. So you have two choices. You either drink deep, study hard, become an expert, or don't try. This is the idea. This is the advice. It's like I usually say this to my students. When you study English, you have to work very hard. If you finish four years of studying English and your English is still bad, it's really sad. So study hard, drink deep from the Pyrrhean spring. And look at the perfect rhyme, the couplet. If you count this, 10 syllables, 10 syllables, five feet, five feet. A pop was very famous for satire also. Many people wrote satire in the Augusta age. And like his friend Dryden, he criticized his poetic uh, he uh, two texts here was examined today. Number one is Dunciad. You know, yeah, Dunciad. Just one little thing about Dunciad. You know, Mac MacFlacknow, the poem by Dryden, yes. in yeah, which yes, he criticized his friend, yes, that he'd be the, uh, the, his literary rival. Mm -hmm. It's the same. In this poem, there is satire and attack on the dullness of his literary rivals. But remember, it doesn't necessarily mean that his rivals are bad or dull. It means that Alexander Pope does not like, like him. <laughs> because he said the craziest thing about John Donne. He has no imagination. Yeah. And even like John Donne was criticized by Johnson, by Dryden, by Samuel Johnson, and everyone agreed that John Donne has Wait. this weird, crazy imagination. Wait. He's a witty poet. Alexander Paul was like, no, he doesn't even have, have, have an, an imagination. An He's not ima imaginative. Is he correct? Is he right? I don't no. think so. No. So don't take think everything Maybe for granted. Is. Think for yourself. Uh, his most famous work here is The Rape of the Lock. We, we spoke about rape in the, yeah. in the past. But yeah. rape here means stealing something. <laughs> we speak about the rape of Palestine, how Palestine was Stolen was occupied by uh, lock is a lock of hair. A, a lock of hair, yeah. Uh, the rape of the lock is a mock epic satire. You know what an epic poem is? Long. Remember? About, he be wolf, about heroes, battles, heroism, long. like be wolf, always very long, about serious <laughs> issues in the community. But in this poem, very long poem. I'm not sure how many lines, but it's very long. Alexander Pope is criticizing the trivial things of the society. In which, like, in the Arabic culture, we have Dahis al where there was like a 40-year battle over 
you know, two camels, was it two camels or two horses or something? In this story, someone cuts a little girl's lock of hair, and then all hell breaks loose. They start fighting and fighting and fighting. So what is he criticizing? In the rape of the lock, he's criticizing the trivial things in the society. How this fake self-importance, how people pretend to, you know, be great, but in reality they are all, all only fighting about trivial things. There are no heroes in this age. There are no battles in this age. It's all fake, like Dryden said, uh, some uh, probably uh, 50 years or 60, 70 years earlier. Okay, that's the name of the long. So, what is a mock epic? What is an epic? A long, a long poem long. about heroism. Oh, what is what is a mock poem? A mock epic? An epic about a trivial thing. It's an epic. It's a long poem that mocks. Mocks means to mock to something, something to make fun, fun of something. something. But there's also this when you do an exam when you don't do the original like uh, well, sometimes you have to, to to do a trial exam. It's called mock exam. Yes, the mm -hmm. three. Mock yeah. test. Mock test. Yeah. So mock epic, it's epic, but it's not an epic because you have like a thousand lines. But what is it about? It's someone praising his mouse device, or someone, you know, fighting, killing some many people because they stole his marker, or about a trivial thing. We have this in India, in Gaza here. We have a lot of people who would fight and do horrible things only because someone did something trivial and stupid. Yes. And that's a kind of, this is an interesting uh, poem to read, uh, to read about. Let's move to the uh, more interesting poems uh, or poets of today. Number one is Mary, lady, actually she's a lady. She was uh, the wife of, uh, I think, the British uh, ambassador to Turkey. Her name is Mary Montagio. Lady Mary Montagu. We already have had a, a Mary before. Ma Mary Man. Mary Man. So we have Afro Ben, Mary Manley, and now Mary Montagu. She was also a satirist. She was also a poet. It is said here, it says in the book, that she was a friend of Paul, but later on she became his enemy. I don't know why. Sounds interesting. But it's also interesting that Alexander Pope is a friend of the wife of the ambassador. So that this is generally what poets did in, the, in this age. They wanted to be close to the royalties, to the court, to uh, the... People in town. In one of her, her uh, poems, in a letter, she told of that satire should like a polished razor key. What's a razor? When men shave the uh, beards, so they use razors, like razor, like very sharp, like sharp knife. Yes. Like a razor keen, like sharp. Satire should be sharp like a razor. This is called a simile. Yeah. Using as or like. It's a metaphor, but it uses like as. or as. Satire is like a razor, sharp. Want, what is the verb here? It wants, it should want, it wants with a touch that is scarcely felt or seen. That is scarcely, it's barely. barely, you don't feel it, you shouldn't feel it. In a way, she is saying that satire has to be subtle and indirect, yes. implicit. If you with read lines. it, you don't think, is she criticizing me or what is she saying here? And this is something that comes from. A woman. In a way, if you read this text, if I didn't tell you this was written by a woman, you can't tell. Can you tell this no. was written by a woman? No. She didn't use words. No. Which proves the idea that women can write poetry like, like men, exactly. There was this uh, novelist uh, 10 years ago who said, I read the first paragraph in a novel and I can't tell whether the writer is a woman or a man. And there was an uproar. Everyone's like, what? Come on. There are similarities, there are differences, but if you say women uh, don't write as good as well as women, no, that's not true. 
everyone has his or her own way and, and style. And finally today, Mary. Ma another Mary. Mary. So three Marys Mary. and one up front. <laughs> Mary Lipper or Leeper was also a famous uh, uh, poet who sadly, sadly died at the age of 24. Hmm. How did she become famous? Because, yeah, she still became famous for some time. Maybe she became famous after her death. Generally, yes. Generally, yes. Her poems were published posthumously. This is a good word to know. You know, post means after. Post exam, post test, after. Pre-reading, post-reading. Posthumously, like John Donne, his poetry was mostly published after his death. You can say after his death or her death, but when you use the word post, you must be, you sound, you know, like a sophisticated a person who knows big I words. Know yeah? Listen, the book says she was influenced by Paul. And my question is, do you agree or do you disagree? She was influenced by, the book says, Mary Lipper was influenced by Alexander Pope. I want you to read this stanza, extract from a poem uh, by Mary Lipper, and tell me whether you see similarities or see influence by Alexander Pope or not. I'll give you one minute. for the theme. The speaker is a man, by the way. But the author, the poet, is a woman. Mm -hmm. Can you read someone? Oh, now, ma'am, has the chat... Madam. Madam, ma'am, ma one syllable. Madam, two syllables. Madam, as the chat goes round, I hear you have ten thousand bound, but that as I, I a trifle hold, give me your person, then your gold. Yet for your own sake, kiss the cured. For your own side, uh, say, kiss, secured, kiss, it is, sick, secured. I hope your houses to insure. Insured. Insured, yeah. Someone else? Back at the back. Okay. Now, Madame, as Can you raise your voice? Speak up. Now, Madame, as the chat goes red, I think you have 6,000 pounds. But that as I travel home, give me your best room down your hotel. This for your say. Secure. 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 I hope you have to Houses to ensure. Houses. Someone here, loudly. Raise your voice, please. Now, madam, as the chat goes round, I hear you have, uh, I hear you have ten thousand pounds. But that, as I, tr I travel all, give me your person, uh, then your gold. Yet for your own sake, tis secured. I hope your house is to ensure. What do you think? What is, the speaker is a man talking to a woman. A woman. What is he telling her? Yeah. I think he's trying to deceive her. He, uh -huh. He's saying in the second line, I hear, I hear you have 10,000 pounds. And then he's saying to her, give me your person. He's trying to own her. In to own line. her? Oh, what an interesting reading. Very good reading. So there is a man trying to trick a woman to tell her Give me your money. And he's blunt, he's vulgar. He's not even trying to hide his deceit. Yes, he's openly to talking to her, thinking that a woman is not smart. So, now, madam, as the chat goes round, I hear you have 10,000 pounds. Yeah, I mean, huh? Like a lot of money, you're hiding a lot of money. You're rich. But I, as a trifling whole, give me your person, because a woman generally was treated as an object, something to own. Give me your person, then your goal. Yet for you, it's not for me. I don't want the money. I think so. I want you weak. You can't protect yourself. Yeah, Maybe people will deceive you, trick you. Give me the money. I'll hide it for you. 
It's like mothers when they yeah. 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 How much money have you ever have you given your mom so far? A lot. Where is this money? It's gone. So it's for your sake. It is secure. I'll secure it for you. I don't want it. I want to protect you. A woman can't live without a man's protection. Yes. I hope your house is to ensure you have houses and that they are insured, or I can take them to make sure that they are, they are safe. This is again satire from a woman, to not, not only to one man, but also to men in general, and how they treat women, how they think women are not smart, are not intelligent, and that they always need a man to protect them, to, to save them, to make that everything they have is secure. The theme is women being smart and powerful. She's giving voice to women like Afro Ben. She's empowering women like Mary Manley. She's, say, she's insisting that women are as smart as men and they are even smarter. So the theme is different from Alexander Pope. So this is a woman writing for women about women issues. Do we have the heroic couplets here? Yes. 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 Round cup, by the way, yes. grammatically speaking, this is pounds. Thousand pounds, yes. but poetic license for the rhyme. Right. Yeah. A uh, a a a so couplet couplet couplet. Three couplets. Three couplets. Is it a head of a couplet? Do we have five feet? No. Four. Four. It's all four. So she's not following. If she is influenced by Alexander Pope, she's not following him. One hundred percent. What is the conclusion here? Women have always written excellent literature. If they were uh, published later on, it wasn't their fault. There must have been poets earlier, probably during Shakespeare, after, even before, a thousand years. But usually, the society would ignore them, would neglect them. One, because they are women. Two, because generally women, like we've seen here, are harsh criticals of men mm -hmm. in general and male superiority. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, uh, the, generally when you speak about uh, the, the woman, how they explore new I ideas, how they satirize and criticize and attack, attack uh, uh, men all the time, and most importantly, how they would usually be critical of male superiority, fake male superiority uh, in the society. And perhaps that's a conclusion. That is one reason why, not because they were writing bad poetry, not because they're not po good poets, because but because the male critics ignored them altogether for their critical uh, uh, poetry. Please. I want to add a comment. We said that in Old English, uh, mainly most poets were religious or heroic because uh, they wrote them, they, the monks chose to write them. Yeah, so we can say it. that women wrote poetry uh, all, uh, from a long time, but they did not write it, so did not have it now. Yeah, probably yes. They didn't want to show it to their parents or family or anybody, yeah. because remember, during Shakespeare, women were not allowed to perform on stage. That's why we we'll speak later on at the end of this course about Virginia Woolf, the feminist critic, who said, a woman has to have dependence on herself. A room of one's own. There's an article called A Room of One's Own. It could be stupid, the idea, but she says you have to have your own freedom and privacy and independence. If you have your own room, if you share a room with your, your, your brothers or sisters, sometimes you're going uh, to hide your talents. If you write poetry, you're, not, you're going to hide it because if somebody sees it, it's going, ah, oh, fine. She writes poetry, yeah, she thinks she's a poet, and then they're going to destroy you for life. Yes. But if you have your own room, which symbolizes freedom and independence yes. and privacy. You can do the talent you like. You can grow, you can develop. I'll stop here, and uh, if you have any question, you're uh, free to ask. And after this, by the way, we're going to start the romantic age. We're going to jump to the romantic age.